Okay, let's get started. Any questions about the class so far? About quizzes, logistics, anything else? Okay, so today we'll talk about memory systems and amnesia. So one question is, um, if we have long-term memories, are they stored in separate memory stores? Um, or is it just one store for all information in long-term memory? When we learn a new skill, uh, where do those memories go? And are those memories stored in the same place as your memories, let's say, for facts that you learn along the way? Things that you learn in this course. Do those reside in the same place? Are the same processes operating on those, on those memories? How about learning about an event, something you've been chatting with your friend and your memory for that conversation? Is that in the same place as your memory for general facts? And researchers believe um, that there are different kinds of me memory systems, different long-term memory systems for different types of knowledge. And they, they operate uh, a bit differently. So here's the big schematic uh, from memory theorists, making distinctions between various types uh, of memory. The main distinction, the one that we'll talk the most about during this lecture, is between explicit memory and implicit memory. So explicit memory uh, is known also under the name declarative memory. These are memories that you can declare. You can consciously be aware of those memories and you can declare, I have this memory, I remember that. On the other hand, on the right hand side, all the red marked memory systems, those are implicit memory systems. These are memories that affect you, they do influence your behavior, but you might not be aware that this is going on. So you can't declare these memories. And, um, so another word for it uh, is implicit memory. So within explicit memory, you can make a distinction between semantic memory and episodic memory. So semantic memory is your memory for facts, general knowledge. And episodic memory is your memory for specific events related to some particular time, related to some particular place or context. We'll talk about these distinctions on the next couple of slides. Then within implicit memory, you can make a distinction between priming. We'll give uh, a number of examples of priming. So priming is a case where you see something or you hear something. Later you might hear something or see something similar. And the second time you are faster in processing. Um, and you don't quite know why you're faster, you just are. And those previous exposures uh, help to prime um, the, the second or subsequent exposures. Another type of uh, implicit memories are procedural memories. So when you learn a new skill, when you learn, let's say, to drive a car, to uh, ride a bike, initially those memories um, are very explicit, declarative. You have to remember a sequence of instructions in order to you know, operate a car. But gradually, these become skills. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult probably for many of you to explain to somebody else how to drive a car. It just, you just know how to do it. And those are implicit memories. Next week, we'll talk about associative learning, um, classical and operant conditioning, where you learn about stimulus response relationships in the environment. And those are also a form of uh, implicit memory. Okay, and there, there are different areas of the brain associated with these uh, types of memory. The medial temporal lobe is um, involved in the, the formation, the long-term storage of explicit memory. And then you have the cortex striatum, amygdala, and cerebellum associated with these forms of implicit memory. 
We, we won't talk very much about the brain in general uh, in this course, 9b, 11b, but there's a few things that are helpful to know. Um, so these are the few terms that you'll uh, be exposed to during this course. Okay, so this might be very basic, um, but let's go over the distinction between semantic memory and episodic memory. Because there are some tricky, tricky things about this. Um, so generally, your semantic memory is your memory for facts about the world. Um, can a canary sing? Your answer is retrieved from some part of long-term storage related to semantic memory. If I ask you, who's the Secretary of State of the US? Who's the Secretary of State? John Kerry. Who was the previous Secretary of State? Hillary Clinton, right? So those are facts that you've learned. Well, you might not know it. Um, for those of you who do know it, you've learned this at some point. Um, so it, they actually start, uh, facts start as episodic memories because you might remember learning about John Kerry or Hillary Clinton becoming the Secretary of State. But gradually they become semantic memories when they become um, uh, d divorced from the context. When you don't remember the source uh, related to a fact, you don't remember the time at which you learned it, uh, the place where you've learned it, um, then it becomes more like a semantic memory. So episodic memories, on the other hand, they are highly contextualized. They relate to a specific um, time and place. If I ask you, what did you eat for breakfast? You remember that time, you remember the place, etc. Where were you for the Super Bowl game? If you were there, you can vividly remember sort of the, the contextual details. So those are episodic memories. But again, the tricky thing is um, episodic memories, they might become semantic memories. Generally, you accumulate knowledge over time. And over time, you might uh, learn certain things as facts, uh, but they started out as episodic memories. So here's a little exercise. Um, if I remember that I got soaked in the rain yesterday while walking to class, is that episodic or semantic? Okay. Barack Obama is the president of the US. Right, but suppose you remember being at the inauguration. All right, and he became the president at that time. So that's, that's more like episodic, right? It can be a little fuzzy sometimes, this, this distinction. My first grade teacher could not pronounce my name the first day of school. Episodic. California facing severe drought conditions. Yeah, more like semantic. But again, you might retrieve this knowledge from personal experience, driving around and seeing uh, the severe drought for yourself. All right, the other, um, this is one of the most important distinctions during this lecture between implicit memory and explicit memory. So implicit memory is where your past experiences they influence you, but you might not be aware of it. Um, so you have some memories in your long-term memory. They affect you. You don't know that you have them, but they do in influence you. Explicit memory, uh, or declarative memories, are memories where whenever you can say, I remember that, I remember that, I did this. Um, and those involve, almost by definition, some conscious access to information from the past. So let's do a little test to make this distinction between explicit memory and implicit memory. I'm going to show you some words, I think for about 20 or 30 seconds or so. So study these words for an informal memory test later. So here we go. So I read these words. Okay. So now there are two ways to test you. One is with an explicit memory test, and we won't do this here in this class, but you can imagine that you have to write down as many words as you can remember from that specific list. On the other hand, 
We can do an implicit memory test uh, where we test your performance in a way that seems unrelated to the original sort of study list. But we can, we can indirectly measure your memory for these words. So we'll show um, on the next slide some word fragments and some anagrams. And for the word fragments, you just have to fill in some of the missing letters uh, to make it a valid word. For the anagrams, you shuffle the letters around to make this a valid English word. So guess what each word would be. So how about the first one? You make this sponge. How, would you, how did you know that? So this was the word sponge that you saw before, right? Um, I did not ask you specifically to, to make the word sponge. Who knows? There might be another combination. Seems unlikely, but um, right? I'm just asking you, create, um, you know, make, some, make a word from this anagram. How about this one? Okay. How about this one? What, what is this? Licorice. This, this one I find very difficult. What is it? <laughs> Chocolate doesn't work. That's what I want to see too, but um, camouflage. Camouflage. How, how about this one in the bottom? Llama, right? It's, difficult, it's a difficult anagram, but you've seen this word before on the previous slide, and you might have some conscious recollection of that. But you are faster in processing these anagrams because you've seen, you're primed by the stimulus, uh, by that specific stimulus. And at some point, your conscious memories might fade away from the, those, those words, and you might still have these residual performance benefits because of your earlier exposure. And those, that's, that's an effect of implicit memory. Now, um, so we talked about this word fragment completion task. So whenever you fill in missing letters or parts of the letters are obscured, um, the fragments are often completed. If you have multiple ways to complete it, let's say, people tend to complete it with the word that they've seen before, recently. You don't have to do it like that. You're not instructed to, to do it like that, but that's often the result because of these, these residual implicit memories. What's astounding is that amnesics, we'll talk about amnesics in the, in the second part of the lecture, they often have Im spared implicit memory. They might not explicitly remember any word from that list, but they might still respond in similar ways that you responded. They might form llama pretty quickly. And they will claim, I've never seen the word llama on that study slide. I don't remember the study slide. I might not even remember you as a researcher. Um, we'll see some examples of that. So this suggests that implicit memories might be stored somewhere else, uh, separate from explicit memories. So uh, I want to talk about one um, experiment in detail that shows this interesting dissociation between uh, explicit and implicit memory. So it is an experiment by Graf, Squire, and Mandler, 1984. Standard study sort of uh, uh, paradigm involving studying random words, like cheese, house, and lots of other words. And then in one condition, subjects were asked uh, to uh, complete a Q, like CH, uh, with some words. So this is a queued recall task. And they're specifically instructed to complete it to a word from the study list. So only cheese is correct here. Any other uh, valid English word uh, would be incorrect. Now, another test is implicit memory, where you just have to complete in any way that makes, makes a word. So it could be choose, could be chance, there's probably tons of ways to complete uh, that word. Now they did this experiment with two uh, groups of subjects. Normal controls, people like you and me, um, and uh, amnesics. So here are the results. So the bars on the right hand side show the results for this queued recall and this completion task for the controls and amnesics. So in the queued recall task, 
the controls are better, they can form more words than the amnesics. Totally not surprising, right? Amnesics can't remember very much. They can't form new memories very well. And we'll talk about anterograde amnesics, for which this is the case. So of course you'll get this distinction because that, that's what amnesics, um, that's their problem. They can't remember specific sort of episodic memories. On the other hand, when they're tested in this word fragment completion task, they, if anything, they're slightly better than controls. Now, it's a little puzzling why it would be better, but the, the main finding is that their performance on the completion task is about the same as on the queued recall task. They're doing the same thing. They're completing it with the words that they remember, if they remember it from the list. And so there's no distinction between sort of this implicit and explicit memory task. They just basically, the only thing they have is these implicit memories. <clears throat> the controls, however, they might be thinking, oh, I have to, I have to think about a different word, a di different from the one from the study list. And they are searching around, and that's why they are performing worse on this uh, word fragment completion task. Now, there was another task <clears throat> I didn't mention, the free recall task. Again, not surprising if you have to remember any word from any order from that list. Normal controls are far better than amnesics. The main finding is that uh, implicit memories are spared uh, in amnesics. Um, so they're, they're either about the same relative to controls, or in this case, remarkably, they're somewhat better than controls. Any questions about that? Yes? So it might be that, that uh, normal control subjects, they, they, you remember cheese. But you might think, ah, I can't say cheese. Maybe I might have to complete it with something else, right? Because it's a different condition. So you might be searching for some other possibility, and then you give up at some point if you don't find another word. That might be one possibility. Yeah. If you do this experiment over and over and over again, normally you would find that anesics are about the same level as normal controls on implicit memory tests. Yeah. So don't read too much into this finding that controls are worse. Right. Okay. So there, there's various forms of these implicit memories. Uh, we've talked mostly so far about priming effects. But there's also procedural memory, your memory for skills, how to ride a bike, how to drive a car, uh, how to ski, etc. <clears throat> and those are difficult to verbalize, um, but clearly these are long-term memories that are, that are helpful. There's also perceptual learning. If you do a lot of video gaming, um, you learn, you become better, more, more quick, uh, because you learn uh, about your visual environment in, in, in these games. Um, that's improving your performance. Next week we'll talk about classical conditioning, stimulus-response relationships. So there are several interesting uh, real-world consequences uh, and applications of implicit memory. One is um, that you can plagiarize um, something without being aware of it. So there are cases where you come up with an idea, and let's say you might, if you're a researcher, you might publish about it, but it turns out you are You've copied somebody else's idea, but you just formed an implicit memory about it, and you just forgot the source of your idea. Now, this has led to some interesting lawsuits. Um, one involved George Harrison, uh, a former member of the Beatles. So he's a songwriter, and in the 1970s, he uh, wrote this song that sounded remarkably similar to another song that was a hit song. And the other artist sued George Harrison and said, this is insane. You, you are, this song sounds so similar to this other song. Uh, you, you plagiarized. And uh, George Harrison defended himself by saying, yeah, I probably heard that somewhere. Um, but I didn't you know, intentionally copy it. And the, law, the, um, the judge ruled against him. He said that unintentional plagiarism is still plagiarism. Uh, just tricky, so you might not be aware that you're plagiarizing something. 
Another very interesting recent application of implicit memory is based on um, uh, developing new authentication systems. New ways to provide a password to enter some system based on implicit memories. Um, and this is ongoing research. This is not sort of tested in the real world yet, but <clears throat> it's an interesting idea. So many of you have, have you know, tons of passwords. What a pain to remember your passwords explicitly, right? And you can't remember just one password. You have to have multiple passwords for security reasons. You want to write it down, but you can't really write it down. That seems like a bad idea. Like, how do you... Uh, there has to be something better than current password systems. So researchers had the idea to plant a password in your mind so it's there, but you're not aware of it. Would be very convenient. Um, so nobody can ask you or coerce you in giving up your password because you don't even know that you have a password. So how does this work? Well, it's a prototype idea, right? So it's a, it's a bit out there. Um, it's based on the game of Guitar Hero. Um, so in Guitar Hero, you have to uh, follow a sequence of, um, of buttons that are lighted up, right? Uh, to form a musical score. And you have to basically follow the, the buttons that light up, you know, at the exact time. And normally this forms some musical score that makes sense. But you can have um, subjects tracking some random score, some random uh, sequence of buttons. And people can learn this, right? Um, you can actually become faster at responding to these sequences if you're trained on the sequence over and over again. And that forms the idea of, of getting a secret password based on that particular random sequence that you're learning. That forms your password. When uh, you ask uh, participants to reconstruct that sequence that they've just learned for 45 minutes, they can't retrieve it. Um, because it's so random, it's so long, it's like 30, the, the sequence is 30 symbols or buttons long. So you don't have an explicit memory for it. You, can, you cannot even recognize it if, it, if it's shown to you in, in right in front of you. And then the, the, the remarkable bit is the, at the time of authentication, the computer presents to you some sequences. And if you are playing faster on the sequence that belongs to you because of your implicit memories, then that must be your uh, password than if you are, you know, than if you play slowly on some other random 30-letter uh, sequence. Now, it's not very practical because at authentication time, you have to play Guitar Hero for about five, six minutes with all these different sequences to authenticate you. So imagine that you're standing there with your guitar in front of an ATM. Um, <laughs> not very practical, but it's a great idea. Does that make sense, this, this application? Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about amnesia. So there are two types of amnesia. There's retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. And here's a little um, picture to, to highlight the difference. So there might be some moment where there's some brain injury, some accident that has affected your memories. If you have trouble remembering events that happened before your injury or your accident, you might have retrograde amnesia. If you're, you have trouble forming new memories after the brain injury, then that counts as anterograde amnesia. That's the anterograde period. So in both cases, we might be talking about trouble retrieving things from the past. So suppose this is the present day. But what matters is not where the present is. What matters is when was the, the trauma or injury. And are, are, you, are you impaired for the period before or after uh, the trauma? That's, that's, that makes the distinction between retrograde and anterograde amnesia. So there are several ways in which amnesia can be induced. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is through a concussion. Uh, that can lead to temp temp 
temporary retrograde amnesia, as well as a mild form of anterograde amnesia, in most cases, that will disappear. Um, that just temporary and you, you, you come back fine. Um, there are some severe cases of people, uh, alcoholics, who uh, develop this vitamin B1 deficiency. And that can have, uh, in the extreme, uh, can lead to Korsakoff syndrome. That's a severe form of anterograde amnesia, the total inability to remember new information. There's, of course, Alzheimer's, which can be very diffuse. At some point, your episodic and semantic memories uh, can be affected. There could be damage in, for a variety of reasons, because of surgery, because of an accident to your hippocampus and thalamic structures. That can have uh, some very bad consequences. It can lead to anterograde amnesia. I'm not so sure if ECT is still applied, but there used to be a period when psychiatric patients, um, if nobody could deal with these patients, they were just shocked into submission. Um, which seems like a really, really bad idea um, because now we know that induces amnesia. Now the one um, substance, midazolam, you might not be aware of it, but you might, be, might have been exposed to it uh, without you knowing it. The dentist occasionally, uh, for some surgical procedures that are unpleasant, might offer you midazolam to calm you down. Right? If you're a nervous person, like, ah, this is a terrible thing that, that will happen to me, let's, let's take midazolam. Calms you down, it's great. Uh, the side effect is that you can't remember what happened during the procedure itself. It blocks the formation temporarily of new memories. It's a great research tool. You can, have, uh, you can apply this in the lab and it's just amazing. Uh, people don't remember what happened during the experiment after being delivered to midazolam. Yes? You're Yes, you're conscious. That makes it very strange, right? You, you're aware of what's happening and you can track what's going on, but at some point um, it, it, it becomes all fuzzy, right? Because you're not forming new memories. Right? You can remember what, what happened before, but at some point you hit this boundary and like, then you forgot everything during this period. It, it's, it's a very strange effect. Uh, how can you be conscious and still forget? Yes. Yes. I think those are all blockers um, that have blocked uh, your, your memory formation, yes. Um, and gradually it might come back, but you might be missing all the information sort of around the, the, the surgical procedures, yes. Yeah, so let's talk about retrograde amnesia. So this is where you have trouble uh, remembering events before some trauma. And the remarkable finding is that you reverse the typical for forgetting curve. For normal people, more recent events are better remembered than events that happened a long time ago, with that minus, minor caveat of the, uh, of the reminiscence bump. But for retrograde amnesics, you often find these reversed temporal gradients called Ribbit's Law, where the early memories are actually better remembered than the more recent memories uh, before the trauma. And the explanation here is that uh, memories constantly undergo what's called uh, consolidation. Memories are not just formed and then left alone, they're constantly being strengthened and changed over time. The earliest memories are consolidated the most, they're firmly lodged in your mind, whereas the more recent memories are more fragile because they're not consolidated very well. So when you have some head trauma, those recent memories that normally you would retrie retrieve them very well, uh, they're not very well consolidated, so they might be severely disrupted. But this temporal gradient um, flips back over time again to a regular sort of forgetting curve. So here's uh, one experimental finding uh, of this temporal gradient. This was a subject um, who had some trauma in the 1960s, 1970s. 
and was asked about events uh, from their own lives from uh, a much earlier period. And this subject was tested based on knowledge from their own diary. Uh, so this person kept an extensive diary over a long period of time. And here you can see this reverse temporal gradient where memories for things that happened a long time ago are better remembered than more recent events. So this is this reverse forgetting curve. Normally your forgetting curve would be the opposite way, right? So it would go, actually go o up over time. Okay, so on the other hand, there's anterograde amnesia, um, and this is an inability to acquire new information. Uh, has anybody seen the movie Memento? It came out uh, a while ago. Um, so watch this movie. Uh, tell somebody else that your professor recommended seeing that movie. Um, it's, uh, it, it describes this anterograde amnesic that tries to desperately hold on to new information by writing on his own body. And on top of that, the movie is played in reverse chronological order, which creates enormous confusion in the viewer. And that's exactly the confusion that this entrogate music is, is going through. It's, 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 it's very well, well done. Now, entrogate amnesics can hold on to information in their short-term memory, so they can rehearse phone numbers. But at some point, it's, it's gone. It can be transferred to long-term memory. It does not affect general knowledge from the past, so they can retrieve facts um, uh, generally, but it's difficult to learn new facts. It doesn't seem to matter what modality is being tested, uh, all modalities are affected. And it spares skill performance. Um, so these people can learn new skills, can learn to play an instrument, but they might not remember explicitly that they have learned to play that instrument. Uh, which is, can lead to very bizarre circumstances. The most famous case is H.M. Uh, H.M. recently died, um, so now we know him by his full name, Henry Gustav Molaison. And because of H.M., we know a lot about memory uh, and about amnesia. So he had a surgery in 1953 when he was 27 years old to deal with his uh, epileptic seizures. Now at the time, um, we didn't know very much about the brain. Um, we didn't know the f brain, much about brain function. And these um, well-intentioned um, doctors, they decided to remove his medial temporal lobes, so, so deep inside the brain, um, in, including the hippocampus, to deal with his epileptic seizures. The surgery was successful, the seizures disappeared, but he became the, the, sort of the first sort of severe anterograde amnesic. So here are some uh, well, gruesome details of, of the brain structures that uh, were removed in HM. Uh, so especially here on this visualization, you can see that the, that the hippocampal structures, they were you know, completely removed. Um, so it would be very rare for any uh, surgeon to, to apply this kind of surgery, because now we know this can lead to severe anterograde amnesia, amnesia. And it's not quite if that um, outweighs the benefits of overcoming these seizures. So HM could still retrieve memories uh, acquired before his surgery. He's normal in many ways. He had a normal vocabulary, average IQ, his working memory was fine but he could not form new memories after uh, his surgery. So he could not remember people that he met. He could not remember the doctors that he met on a daily basis. Every time he had to be introduced to those people uh, over and over again. A more subtle effect was that he didn't learn new facts or general knowledge. There some, were some words that were introduced after 1953, like jacuzzi, granola, flower child. He did not learn those words. So it suggests that both his episodic as well as semantic memories um, yeah, were, were impaired uh, in terms of the new stuff entering there. Now he was able to learn new skills. Um, so one of these skills is, is called um, 
reverse uh, mirror tracing. So this is a task where you are tracing the contour of a shape, like this diamond here. And you have to stay within these lines. But you can't see your hand directly. You have to look in a mirror to do this. It can be extremely confusing because you have to learn this whole new mapping between perception and motor. Um, uh, your perception motor mapping has to be sort of retrained. But you can do this. Normal people can do this, and they get better over time. But remarkably, HM also got better over time. So this chart graphs the, the progress over time in terms of the number of errors that he made. And you can see after several days, he made fewer and fewer errors. But he wasn't aware that he became better. In fact, he didn't remember being in the experiment the day before. On top of that, he didn't remember the doctors that were uh, conducting this whole procedure. Uh, like, who are you? Uh, why am I in this experiment? Uh, what is this experiment about? Uh, so this is very strange dissociation between his explicit and implicit memory. So here's another task um, that can test your, your, uh, your implicit memory system. If I ask you, okay, this, this word is, is written in mirror reverse. So you have to read from, um, from right to left. So what word is spelled here? Bedraggled. Okay, very good. How about this word? Grandiose. Okay, how about this one? The third one. Precious. Okay, now let's go over here. What's, what's written here? It's bedraggled again, right? Was that easier the second time you did it? Maybe. How about this one? Grandiose. So you can do experiments where you learn to mirror verse read. It's kind of a painful experiment to be, to be in. Um, it's in a very unnatural experience. Um, but, you know, you can conduct an experiment with this. And you can do this with normal controls, people like you and me. And you can do this with amnesics. In this case, this was done with one patient, N.A., who's a Korsakoff uh, patient, so severe anterograde amnesic. Now, this graph charts the progress over time. In fact, over 94 days of training. Imagine uh, being in that experiment. And the, the vertical axis measures the, uh, the reading time per triad, right, per, per sets of three. Now, in the left panel, you see the performance for new words, words that you've never seen before. And you can see both the normal controls get better, as well as the Korsakoff patient. So the Korsakoff patient is learning a skill, the skill of mirror reverse reading. That's one remarkable finding. Um, they learn the skill, and they have no memory that they're learning the skill. They have no memory of being in the previous day in that, in that very same experiment. But the most remarkable finding is shown on the right. So sometimes these words are repeated, right? Bedraggled was shown again and again and again. And it turns out, so it's, it's not surprising that controls, they are better, they're, they're more quick than uh, on these uh, repeated word triads than on the non-repeated word triads, right? You learn something about bedraggles, like you see it again and it's like, ah, I know that one, it's bedraggles. So you have specific memories uh, that, help, that are helping you out. But the same is true for this Korsakoff patient. This Korsakoff patient is storing somewhere in their mind, in their brain, a memory for that word bedraggles and all these other words and they're faster on those repeated words. So they learn as a general skill, but they also learn the skill of reading specific words. And how, how, how are they able to do that? Well, they have no explicit memory of any of these words. That's, a, that's part of the mystery uh, of, of this finding. Okay. So I want to show you a little clip of Clive Waring. Clive Waring is a... Um, I think he's still alive today. He's a... Um, He's one of those famous uh, anterograde amnesics, almost as famous as HM. He was an accomplished British museum, um, musician, and he suffered from uh, a, a herpes simplex virus that attacked his central nervous system. It's apparently exceedingly rare that this happens. 
and that uh, specifically affected his hippocampus and part of his frontal lobe. Now, he developed um, some mild retrograde amnesia, but it, he's mostly known for his anterograde amnesia. In fact, his whole experience lasts about 7 to 30 seconds, sometimes a few minutes. But his world is basically contained within this very short uh, time span. Let's see, oh, there's the video. Okay. So one um, remarkable uh, aspect of Clive Waring is that he became aware of his condition. He knew that something was wrong with him, and he tried to get a hold on his whole experience by writing down notes uh, in the same way that this character in the movie Memento was trying to keep track of his world. And first he started to scribble on a piece of paper and then he moved to a, uh, a journal at some point. And then he started to write down um, these entries, 8.31 a.m. Now I'm really completely awake. And the next entry, 9.06 a.m. Now I'm perfectly overwhelmingly awake. In fact, his whole journal is full of these entries. There's actually nothing else that we know in, these, in this journal. He's constantly sort of waking up from something, and he feels the need to put, describe this experience, and then he reads his, perf his previous entries, and this is handwritten, so he, he actually r recognizes his own writing, like, oh, I wrote this. But he has no memory of that writing, so he actually scratches it, you know, like, this is wrong, or this, this doesn't belong in my journal, and he starts over again and writes the same thing over and over. It's a very strange, um, yeah, it must have been a very strange experience for him. So I'm going to show you um, a short video clip. Hopefully this clip works this time. Let's see. Imagine never recognizing your own children or your own home. Not even knowing who you are. Not being able to hold on to the past or present for long enough to imagine the future. Before his illness, 
Clyde was a successful conductor and musicologist. And one of the few things that has survived is Clyde's ability to play the piano. It has been devastatingly sad to watch how frustrating it is for Clyde, who the man I love to suffer so horribly. I do not know of a more horrific state to be in than to have no knowledge of the whole of your life, no knowledge of any events that have ever happened to you, and no idea of anything except now. Clive's tragedy is to feel such intense human emotions without ever being able to anger them into his memory. He's a man utterly lost in time. Okay, I think that's it. So, any comments or questions about that? So, uh, he's saying that he's never seen a doctor before and they're all incompetent. Like, where are the doctors? He's been under extensive medical care, so he just doesn't remember that the doctors have treated him and are seeing him on, on a daily basis. So, Clive is learning some things, um, and all of that goes through his implicit memory system. He did become aware of his situation, his condition, he gradually uh, uh, accepted uh, that there is a big void uh, in, in his memory. He also became aware of the layout of his house. Um, so he actually moved to a different residence to take care of him. He, be he became much uh, better over time at moving around. Clearly he must have learned something. He also, uh, you saw him playing the piano, he played various new pieces um, after his, his condition and learned to play those well. And every time he was puzzled, like, I seem to know this, uh, this piece, and like, how is that possible? Um, but he, yeah, clearly was, was learning new skills. So any question about Clive Waring? Yes. That's, a, that's an excellent question, right? Every time when he says, I'm awake now, I'm awake now, does that happen during his play? I, I don't know. I don't know what his experience of time is. Uh, I, I think it's more flexible than, than what some of the um, literature suggests. Uh, maybe it's during the whole musical sort of event, maybe he's fine. And then when the context changes, maybe that's when the reset happens. But these are, yeah, these are puzzling yeah, questions. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Is it possible that like, other parts of his brain are kind of taking over the job of the missing parts, and that's why he's like slowly, like, remem like not remembering, but like coming to like, understand yes. some of the things that are happening to him? Yes, yes, I, I think that's true. I think there are multiple routes to, to remember information, right? There's, there's clearly the explicit memory route, there's the implicit memory route, there's sort of your knowledge of sort of emotional things, like I know this person, I have a feeling for this person, right? But he might not remember, right, that person. And that's clearly going through a different route in, in the brain, right? Uh, and that, that, that route is, is having more influence than we realize, yes. Be yeah, and it's, it's difficult to study this because it's all unconscious. Okay, here's another famous experiment um, that demonstrates uh, implicit uh, memories. This is from a uh, Swiss physician, Clapperad, who was treating an amnesic woman. Uh, I believe she was a Korsakoff patient, so a severe al alcoholic. And uh, Clapperad was seeing this patient on a daily basis. But every time this patient came in, um, she didn't remember the doctor. And he was a little puzzled, like, does she really not remember me? Um, 
what does she remember? Is there anything she can learn? So he once, um, he offered his hand and he was hiding some pin in his hand and she shook his hand, it was a painful experience, um, very unethical uh, experiment. Uh, <laughs> it was 1911, you could do a lot of things that day. Um, so the next time, uh, she has no memory of him, she has no memory of the event. Um, but he again offers his hand and this time she refuses to shake his hand. And when asked why, she said, well, sometimes pins are hidden in people's hands. <laughs> so there's some, it's somewhere represented in the brain uh, that there was this, this episode. You can play um, Trivial Pursuit with amnesics, um, which seems kind of pointless because they can't remember very much, but um, what's curious is that if amnesics learn the correct answer to some trivial tri trivia question, so suppose they don't know the answer because it's not in the general knowledge, and you say, well, this is the answer, they might not later have a conscious memory for that item, but they might correctly uh, give the answer to it. And when you ask them, like, how did you know that? And then their explanation is, I read about it somewhere. So again, it's, their answer arrives to a different different route. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, can amnesics learn uh, new knowledge? So when it comes to declarative memories or explicit memories, they are severely impaired. When it comes to procedural memories, learning new skills, they can. They can learn to play new musical scores, new instruments, physical things. So generally, their implicit memories are spared. So uh, all these famous cases, these amnesics, they point to these separate memory systems. There's a distinction between working memory and long-term memory. Um, and that distinction is partly inspired by uh, patients like HM. And there's a distinction between explicit and implicit memory, again, inspired by patients uh, like HM and Clive Waring. Now, we won't focus that much about the brain uh, in, this, in this course, but here are a few structures that are useful to know about. So we talked before about the prefrontal cortex. Um, so roughly over here. You need this structure to engage the material to keep things alive in working memory. So we talked about the monkeys that have poor, that have uh, damaged prefrontal cortex and they couldn't do very simple uh, working memory tasks. The hippocampus, it's, it's not actually this, this area that you see here, it's lodged you know, sort of more deeply in the brain. That is needed to transfer your memories from working memory to long-term memory. And finally, there's a whole bunch of structures associated with implicit memory. It's, it's, it's the cerebellum, but it's also other structures uh, where your memories of skills and habits and conditioning uh, where they are stored. So that's it for today. I'll see you guys next week.